I wait for the lovely little dot that says we're live. And we'll we'll let folks kind of trickle into our, our space here this evening. Susan, where um, are you? Are you home? I am. I'm in Portland. Awesome. I've taken over Thorne's room because he's in college. So I've had <laughs> I've put adult, I've just grabbed anything from the wall that's not sports related. I know nothing about him. That's but that's a, that's such an elegant room. It, it's like so. Is he studying um, international finance? I mean, it doesn't look like a sports room. No, I have I have stripped it and taken it over. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Fantastic. Little... I could show you pictures of Kemba Walker and Kevin Durant. They're right there, but you just can't see them. <laughs> All of the, the interior decorating that has happened um, for, for the Zoom lifestyle is, is fascinating. Um, yes. But I wish to welcome you all. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our live virtual event tonight with Susan Conley and Rick Bass. Um, I'm your host, Jessica, from the event coordinator here at the Country Bookshelf, um, not far from where Rick normally is. Um, here in Bozeman, Montana, we are grateful to be sharing this space with our fellow Books in Common Northwest sister stores, uh, Polina Springs Books in Sisters, Oregon, and Madison Books in Seattle, Washington. Visit booksincommonnw.com for more information and viewing the calendar of our upcoming events. We've got a stacked roster for April. Um, you can also follow us on Eventbrite so that you get all of the updates woo, um, <laughs> when we are hosting more events for Books in Common. Before we get to our speakers this evening, I do wanna point out just a couple things about our virtual space. Uh, you can purchase copies of Landslide by Susan Conley and Fortunate Son by Rick Bass by visiting booksincommon.nw.com. I'll post that link in the chat here in just a moment. Um, but you can just click on the logo of your favorite sponsoring store down at the bottom and we'll get those books sent out to you. We are recording the event um, and it will be viewable a little later um, this evening or tomorrow. So if you have to duck out early, please look for that on the Books in Common and W YouTube channel. Um, it's also a great place to check out if you get kicked out of the webinar and can't get back in. Um, you can just check out the simulcast there on um, YouTube. Um, generally, if you run into any tech issues though, exiting and re-entering the webinar usually will work just fine. And if you're having trouble hearing us tonight, I do recommend the use of headphones. Um, I don't know why it's the magic bullet, but it is. So just for all of our um, peace of mind, we do like to remind you that this is a shared creative space that we wanna remain safe for everyone that's joined us this evening. And we ask that you be respectful of everyone who has joined us tonight. Offensive or inappropriate comments or questions will see the user dismissed from this space. Speaking of questions, one thing I forgot to address um, is if you would like to ask a question of any of our panelists this evening, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can leave those questions at any time. I see a lot of you are enjoying utilizing the chat function so you can leave uh, those questions there in the chat and I will be watching for them to share them with our panelists this evening. So joining us this evening we have Susan Connolly who grew up in Maine and is currently coming to us from Maine. She's the author of four previous books including Elsie Come Home. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Paris Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, Harvard Review, the New England Review, and Plowshares. She has received multiple fellowships from the McDowell Connolly Colony, as well as from the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, the Maine Arts Commission, and the Massachusetts Arts Council. She has won the Maine Literary Award and the Maine Award for Publishing Excellence. She is a founder of The Telling Room, a youth creative writing center in Portland, Maine, where she lives and teaches on the faculty of the Stone Coast Writing Program. Rick Bass is a Texas native, now living in Montana, recognized by numerous Pushcart Prizes and the O. Henry Awards, as well as the Texas Institute of Letters. Bass continues to publish celebrated fiction and nonfiction about the natural world and humans' place in it. His recent books include, for a little while, New and Selected Stories and The Traveling Feast, On the Road and at the Table with My Heroes. 
Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susan and Rick. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, Rick, you might have that little mute thing on. <laughs> it's, it's awfully nice to see you though. You too, you too. <clears throat> yeah. What should we converse about? I don't know, here we are, here we are. Maine to, and I, my idea was, was that we were gonna be Maine to Montana, but we're Maine to Utah. Well, I'm almost there, yeah. I could, it's so fun seeing the, the bookstore, the uh, country bookshelf, and like it has all books, bookstores have great scents, great fragrances, great odors, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's an exceptional one, exceptional one. It's good Ooh. to see the books behind Jessica when she was speaking. I, we don't yet have smell o vision technology, but um, I hope <laughs> to live long enough to experience it. <laughs> well, I want to ask you um, straight out of the gate, like I'm really, um, there should be a word, the English language can be a beautiful language, but there's also significant limitations for these new experiences. And, and I have one, um, like novel envy, like I'm so envious of you completing a, a wonderful novel. There's nothing in my experience harder than writing a novel. And uh, my first question is like uh, the structure, like did it, how hard was it? <clears throat> it looks easy, so it must've been hard. I mean, everything fits. Like, I mean, Robert Penn Warren talking about all the King's men, uh, somebody, came up to him one time and said, you know, I reread your book and it, it really works. It really works. It's put, put together so well. It's, it's so fitted. And he goes, fitted? It's put together like a goddamn Swiss watch. And, you know, he was just furious. But um, that's kind of the, the, uh, the feeling I get reading and rereading yours. So like, how hard was it? Yeah, how much structure, plot, outline did you have beforehand? Hmm. You know, I think you read, you heard maybe the first chapter I ever, ever wrote of this because I read it at our beloved Stone Coast MFA in Maine. I don't know if you remember that. It was, um, I do. Yeah. yeah, okay. So two boys, it was the boys, I think, the teen boys, sort yeah. of the wolves, as I call them in Landslide. Um, so the, once I had that, once I had the voices of the teen boys talking to the mom, fighting with the mom really about the Fleetwood Mac and the car, I was pretty much off and running. Um, it, I, I think this was probably my, the, the, the book that caused the least pain to write because I think that it was the book I was most excited to write. How's that? I really wanted to write it. I wanted That's to write it. Yeah. No, it makes me uh, even more envious. I was hoping you would say it was <laughs> it was brutal and I, I can't believe I survived it. I would feel a little better, but now you're telling me you did it easily. So uh, I won't say I hate you, but- uh, No, I mean, we can't say easily. Nothing, nothing that we write is ever easy, but um, how, what will I say? I was so committed to the book mm -hmm. and I, so I was, um, it, you know, so I've written about China, I've written about Paris, I've written nothing, really, I had never written about Maine. So that was daunting, but it was also so familiar. <clears throat> um, and it served me well, that the bar was pretty high. I knew that people would read the book who mattered a lot to me in terms of, you know, truth sayers and fishermen and lobstermen on the Maine coast where I live and where I grew up. And I, I actually had them in mind the whole time. Like, would it pass sort of the shit detector test for them? And would it move them? Um, that was really my highest and biggest worry, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. You know, we're, we're skipping right past telling the audience what the what the book is about. If, if, if y'all haven't read it, haven't bought it, don't, don't know. Um, it'd be fun to hear Susan describe what the book is about or what she thinks the book is about and what and what I think the book is about. Um, and, and I'm just gonna jump forward. I mean, it starts out with this core that, that you, you were talking about, the, the, this mom with these two teenage boys, AKA the wolves and, uh, and, and teen angst. And uh, 
uh, escalates the, the drama and stakes of raising um, <clears throat> young boys, young men in a, in, you know, in a contemporary society. Oh yeah, and then uh, the narrator's uh, husband has his leg blown up in a, in a, a fishing boat accident. Uh, and then shit just starts happening. It gets worse and worse. And, and the, the feeling I get reading it is that there's this um, galaxy, this universe of revolving constellations around the narrators. And I'm struck by, by around the narrator and I'm struck by how the narrator, as should be the case in a, you know, in a, in a first person narration of a novel, all the other characters are moons to her orbit and she's, she has to <clears throat> kind of hold everything together. And I think that's captured so wonderfully with, without a single uh, sentence or phrase of uh, woe is me by the narrator. Uh, you know, it, it's really, that's effective and gripping and powerful. The physical mayhem that proceeds throughout the novel, storms and wrecks and stuff it is secondary to the, the internal uh, conflict. So it, that's again, like a, like a Swiss watch. Um, the question I'm, well, I'm not asking a question. I'm just saying what I think the, the book is about, but your, your point about wanting it to be, ring true to the, to the main folks, uh, another striking thing about the, what we would call secondary or ancillary non-family characters or, or removed family characters is they're, they're so complex. And, uh, you know, at Stone Coast, you're, you're so revered as a teacher. And, and I love hearing secondhand what you say in class. You know, people say, well, Susan says this, Susan says that. And it's always say, fuck, she does? That's awesome. Wow, she did. It's, it's so great. So I just, again, I wonder, you know, you can be a great teacher, but not, not necessarily write a great book. And, and uh, again, I'm really intrigued by how conscious you were of your own writing philosophies and, and beliefs, or if you were just putting your ears back and inhabiting the dream of this story. Mm. There's a question. Yeah, no, I, I love that at the end there. Um, no, I was super, super intentional about um, where I could weave the story of can, can it, I was, I was asking the question, can a mother stay, stay connected to the teen wolves or will she lose them? And can she hold on to them in the book? And then can Maine hold on to commercial fishing? Can Maine hold on to working waterfronts? And they were like these two trains that were going down the track um, and they wove through the family structure. I would say that Rick, the, the key for me in this book, and I know we have some writers with us, is was um, using the metaphor of isolation, right? And putting them on this tiny island so that they had to contend with the sea and the, and the storms and the wind. And they were already isolated down a long peninsula in Maine, but then I put them on the island and then I, the husband Kit gets into an accident. So then they're, they're very alone and, um, I, I was really aware of like pressure, how much pressure could we put on them? Um, and of course, um, landslide, right? So it's just once I landed on this, the Stevie Nicks song, the, the Fleetwood Mac song as my, it was like my, I don't know, my totem, my frame, my, it, I just laid it over the whole book, landslides and ev everywhere you look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> again, it's, it's taught and, and T-A-U-T taught and, and, and uh, you just, by the end of the book, the, the narrator, the, <clears throat> the heroine is, uh, I mean, just pieces of her are flying off. Like it's, it's, again, I keep thinking of uh, celestial stuff, like, you know, uh, big bang kind of stuff, like, you know, collisions hitting the earth and moons blasting off and more and more parts of everybody are, are blasting off the, the husband. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's an intense and incredible profile of, of, uh, of marriage and, and, and of parenting and of uh, isolation and of, uh, you know, it had everything but a pandemic in it. It's really intense. Uh, but each of them was metamorphosed, you know, changed. It's like you, you mentioned the phrase that the narrator raising teen wolves, but, and not losing them, but, but she, she changed them. I mean, she, which is pretty impossible to do. I mean, that's what good parenting does. It changes, uh, uh, something that's not working, you know, it gives, it gives a path for change and, and it's really hard 
you know, once an adolescent gets going with their ears back, uh, it's hard to get them back on track. And, and uh, yeah, so she was really, she was fully engaged at that. The husband and wife were fully engaged at changing and surviving. And yeah, and, and the, the, the lobster men, the lobster, what are they called? What are lobster women called? How is that, how do we talk about that? Lobstering? Yeah. It's a problem. It's a problem. Yeah. Lobster, lobster women, but yeah. Yeah. And then, and yeah, what's confusing in this state is that everyone's called a fisher man or woman, but then there's lobster within that. So you want to know what's confusing in this state? Everybody's trapping wolves and shooting them in the head and getting elected for governor. But back to your novel. <laughs> Well, no, now you're going to, now we get to do the, the part where we start to talk about politics and activism versus writing. Um, are they going to, are they going to kick us off of the, uh, the screen? Is this where we get removed for? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I asked you what you were up to, you, you pretty much said you want, you kind of went to Grizzlies and Yak and, and I, you know, I want to talk about Fortunate Son, but it sounded like your energy was with the Grizzlies. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And, and thank you for <clears throat> uh, accommodating that space with that, that assessment and observation. It, it's correct. Uh, um, and it makes me all the more, it should, I just need to say it envious. Like, uh, you know, Fortunate Son is a collection of essays from 40 years and, uh, but it's not what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm fighting for Old Forest. I'm fighting for the last 20 grizzlies in Yak. Um, and I'm fighting to reroute this high volume through hiker trail out of alpine habitat in the Yak where grizzlies with their female grizzlies with their cubs depend on these little yards that are not, alpine areas that in the Yak are not much bigger than you know a suburban yard or, or this hotel room. Uh, and it's just not a place to be putting a, a recreational high volume uh, through trail, uh, but boy, it's just hard to, it's hard to legislate. It's hard to change, um, hard to change what's, what's wrong. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak for myself for a moment and say that I've tried to write this story of um, the collapse of commercial fishing in Maine from two angles. I've tried to write it, you know, like through the front door, through a feature story, right, of, of journalism that I just actually closed today. And then I wrote a novel, Landslide. And I'll tell you that the novel is a lot more fun <laughs> because you get to, in a way, and I'm gonna say easier, even though I don't mean easier to write, but easier to amplify, easier to amplify the things that I most wanted to like leverage because um, I could make stuff up and I could be more sort of stealth, but, you know, probably, I, I mean, very different audience in a way, different like impact, I bet. Um, but I'm just wondering, Rick, I'm thinking about parts of essays I've heard you read out loud, whole essays I've heard you read out loud about the Grizzlies and Yak. And I'm thinking, is there is there still like craft involved in this? Crafting your, or what, where is the writer in this? <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, there, I mean, there's, there should be craft involved in it. And, and, and you know, what do you, yeah, what, it has to be. I mean, that's, everybody needs to bring their, their skills and talents to the, to the issue. And so if you're, if your skill and talent is, is a, is a, a writer of craft, then yeah, you have to bring craft to the, to the issue. But if you're, yeah, whatever your skill is, I think that's the, that's the strength that the bears need uh, in, in this conversation, this discussion. And, uh, I mean, I, I started talking about it the last year or two, it being, are we going to let these last 20 grizzlies go extinct? Are we going to fight really hard to protect them and to recover them? Uh, it does crystallize to me to be a, a discussion about manners. Like, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, just, it's just rude to drive a species off of the face or a race of bears off the face of the earth. It's like, uh, who do we think we are? And, and so... Um, using that simple thought like you know why are we doing this to this this animal that is our in many ways our superior it's been here a lot longer than we have uh, this incredible maternal culture it's the second slowest reproducing land mammal you know on the continent uh the mother teaches the cubs where to go where to be safe um why are we 
why are we not watching this? Why are we not paying attention to this? Why are we not excited about this? Why are we not learning from this? Why are we not asking questions about this? It's, it's, it seems more important. I know this is like that horrible rubric that and rhetoric that environmentalists use saying, um, we have to protect, we have to save the grizzlies to save ourselves. And I used to not believe that. I used to say, oh, you know, no, we're, we're gonna be okay. Like we're just gonna be bereft and grieving and, and, and marginalized and, and lesser, but we won't die without grizzlies. But I, you know, the more I've seen these last couple of years, I think, I do think a lot of our uh, survival depends on the ability to uh, learn manners, uh, you know, and I think it all in all aspects of the social dilemma and struggles and wars that we find ourselves in, like manners would solve about 75% of it. So I didn't answer your question. I just got up on the soapbox about the 20 grizzlies. But yes, craft is involved. Yes, but spe specificity, you know, what does a grizzly eat? Uh, you know, what are they smelling when they're walking across the ground? What's the ground? Is it soft? Is it stony? Do they like moist days? Do they like overcast days? Uh, where would you go if you're wearing a 70 pound fur coat? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Such good stuff. Um, I'm thinking about um, something interesting. There's, there's a correlation here, which is that what the, one of the I wrote landslide for two reasons. One is I thought that that boys, teenage boys in this country were, were getting a vast, vast short end of the stick and a sort of a vast sort of reduction or reductivity or like a, a sellout. And we, we know it, but I hadn't seen it in literature all that much, like really examining the tropes and the, the idea that the teenage boy is just menacing and across all colors, all class, right, boy, bad. Um, but the other reason was because on a good day, we apparently have 20, 20 active year round boats left commercial fishing in Maine, you know, that's it. And I was so shocked by that number because we are the iconic fishing state, right? We are the state that everybody comes to to see the fishing village. And similarly, I didn't think anybody was very upset about it. I didn't think that people were, were even really aware of it. Or, and if they were, they didn't seem to care very much. And I mean, I'm only two months, not even quite two months into the life of this book, but I, I find that, that I wanna talk about that a lot. And I hope to keep talking about it and shining a light on it. Um, because there's a lot of good work being done here in Maine to sustain the fishery and build it back. Um, but um, most people I know had no idea that, that, that we've gone from 300 boats to 20 and that the fishermen, you know, are, are just barely, barely hanging on. I mean, they're, they're, they're actually making less money now than they did 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, no, these, these, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I find myself wanting to ask a cheesy question, like, would you consider a sequel? I mean, yeah, the, the teen boys, I mean, you have that wonderful uh, epigram or, or whatever it's called at the front of the book by, by Rick Moody, you know, about, about boys and, you know, which is an amazing story. And, and, and these boys are, are incredibly uh, accurate and nuanced and, uh, yeah, it's it's as great a, a portrayal of, of teen contemporary boys as exists. Teen, yeah, teen boys, teen men. Um, but the uh, yeah, the fishing. I find myself thinking not about the the fisher the fisher people, the lobster folk, but the uh, the species itself. You know, the object of of our consumption, the object of our pursuit, the object of our desire. Like the, the prey shapes the predator. And, you know, this is an incredible effing animal, you know, a, a lobster. I mean, like, you know, we, we know David Foster Wallace's brilliant essay. And it, this is, there's not another animal on the planet like a lobster. And again, what does it mean to us if we, if they are vanishing? Uh, and what does it mean to us if, if immediately or vanishing concurrently with them is, is the, uh, 
the race of men and women and families who, who pursue them and who uh, know them and who are intimate with them. It's like, we don't just lose one or the other. I mean, we lose both and that's, the losses compound from there. But what, you know, what can we learn from lobsters? Uh, uh, you know, the, the lobster the fishermen and fisherwomen know better than, than we do. Yeah. Oof. Um, do you, if I read a tiny bit of this description of this village, will you read it a little bit of um, grizzlies and yak? Will you, do you, are you, I, that's a you, great idea. That's a great okay. idea. But, All right, um, cool. That's what I was hoping. I know we talked about that earlier, so I just wanted to make sure. All right. So, cause I'm hoping we have people that don't know Maine that well or haven't come to Maine or, um, so I thought I would just take us to the, um, so here's the moment that I was just saying where um, Jill, the narrator of this book, whose husband has had his leg blown up and he's in a hospital in, in Nova Scotia, she's trying to get a better loan for the trawler. It doesn't go very well. She's leaving the credit union in her little town in Maine. So she, um, she makes her way out of the credit union and climbs in the Subaru on Front Street and close, I close my eyes and breathe. I'm going down to the village to film Shorty Cater. He's been deciding all fall whether or not to sell his pier to a developer from New Jersey. And he has news. Shorty is the son of Jimmy's younger sister. If you say Sewell Village around here, people know you mean archers and you mean Jimmy. He's got one of the biggest lobster boats on the coast and owns the pound. And in this way, he's like a village king in Ireland. At first, Jimmy didn't want me talking to anyone for my film. He didn't understand how a film was going to help save his village. He doesn't go to films or only if they have Clint Eastwood in them. I told him that you can only lose so much of your heritage before there's no going back. I said we needed to protect the waterfront and that the film would help. I told him there were only 20 commercial fishing boats left in the state. Maine's a big place, I said then. 20 boats in the fleet, and that's it, which is when I think I got him. He's a proud man and proudest of his village. I know he doesn't want it to change to something it was never intended to be. When you come upon the village in a car, you're looking down on it from the top of the hill and it appears enchanted, like in a children's book with drawings of the place where fisher people live. 50 or so little wooden houses with dark green forest on three sides and a picturesque harbor at the bottom. People come from hundreds of miles away and from other countries to photograph it. Kit's sister Candy stores in a clapboard house on the ledge above the harbor. She and Flip raised their three kids here. It's a general store that sells milk and batteries and bologna and ice cream. In the mornings before the sun's up, Candy makes eggs and pots of coffee for the fishermen and serves them at a counter in the back. Flip's ice house is next to the store, a flat roofed steel box where fishermen and lobstermen and oyster farmers and clamors and seaweed harvesters get their ice. Jimmy's wharf sits be beside the ice house and the pound is inside a wooden shed at the end of the wharf. Everyone knows everyone in the village. This isn't meant to sound sentimental. Everyone knows where you're going in your boat and how your daughter did in the middle school play and if your marriage is off the rails. And anyone who's not in some way related to someone in the village is a little suspect. I went to art school and make documentary films and wear clogs in winter. So I've never really gotten over my outsider status. Sometimes I think I'm shooting this film in the village to show that I belong here. When I'm actually making the film, I'm completely sure about what I'm doing. It's only later that I wonder. All right, so that's Maine. That's Maine. <laughs> um, so maybe we should just go to Montana. Should we just like do Maine and then Montana? Or it doesn't sound dissimilar from Montana. Oh, cool. Uh, some of the right. small towns, yeah, that, that northern tier. That's what I thought. I was having a I was having a um a feeling of that. And I need to say, because I was so struck by this today, because I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I came upon your first book, Winter, when I was graduating from college in Vermont in the sort of early 90s. Well, is that, was that your first book? Am I imagining that? Close enough. Yeah, okay. 
Um, it pretends to be your first book because it like goes back to the beginning of That's your time true. in Montana, right? Yeah. I like, anyway, I thought that book was so structurally tight and genius how you wove those different threads. But I also, and, and I also felt like immersed, immersed in place in the most delicious way. And so I'm, sh I just, everything I read echoes for me and stays in my head. And I, I know I carry your eye for place and your, your um, incredibly kinetic language with me. Like when I try to render place. So I just had to say that. Well, um, I, it, it's really lovely to hear. Thank you. Um, what, what strikes me is uh, the way you write about place there, you're doing it through the people. And that's, I think that's requisite. I mean, there's, I think we really as nature writers uh, can get into a real trap of, you know, using the bears or the eagles or the salmon or, or the hamsters, whatever they are to represent the place. And people don't read books to read about beavers. They read books to read about people. And, and that's what, you know, is done well here. Uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a super book. I hope folks will buy the shit out of it. I think they'll probably, I think it'll be read a long time, you know, and referred and taught across generations. Like, I, I wonder, you know, you talk about a film, um, you know, the filmmaker is, you know, a, a, one of the subplots or, or not even a subplot element in, in the, you know, we didn't talk about the, the, the economic hardships. That, I mean, that the narrator is, there's just like, I mean, she, she is losing her shit and she, she, she survives. Uh, it's so cool. Yeah, she's, tough. she's tough. Yeah. Um, she's tough. Yeah. So no, I'm really curious if you, if you read now, I will, I will be really curious the echoes of, of these, these similar isolated places. Um, and we'll be all in for a treat. I will, I will read a, a section. Just uh, This is a book about Texas. Uh, I don't know how many pages it is. It's not big. Um, it's 189 pages. And, and Susan and I talked last night about reading a section. And I'll have four pages about grizzlies in this 189 book about 189 page book about Texas, but I will read it. But, but before I want to finish my thought. Um, I wonder about you know, with all of the marvels of, of multimedia, um, if in your book or in, in paperback or something, you can have like DVDs, is that what they're still called? You know, of, of a documentary about the lobster fishery. I don't like the word fishery, but the lobsters uh, and, and such. Or, or is it like on your, your web page, website? I just, I, I'm excited about this conversation. I mean, you, it's, it's a work of li literature, it's art, it's a novel. It's not an activist tract, but hearing you speak about, you know, the passion about, well, I mean, you, I mean, you could have, you could have shit about, yeah, young boys getting, young men getting the short end of the stick in society. It's like it could turn literature could turn into activism, I think, more easily now than in the past. I don't know. It's just a thought. I don't want to brush the moth wing magic off of the novel by getting all activist about it. But no, I like that very much, and I. I hope to do some of that. I aspire to that very much. I will, after reading the book, I will watch the documentary. <clears throat> this is from a, um, an essay of, about maps, about you know drawing maps as a hunter, uh, drawing maps as a geologist looking for oil and gas, uh, the powers and dangers of, of maps and the allure of maps and the, uh, yeah, the danger of maps. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know how to preface it. There's a sentence here that doesn't make sense to me, but I have to read it. Uh, no, I don't. I'll skip that paragraph. The valley where I now live in Northwestern Montana and where I've lived for 34 years has the most endangered subpopulation of grizzlies in the state. Only 20 remain here in the Yak. The Yak is a different valley from the rest of the rock and ice scapes of Western Montana. It's the state's lowest elevation and the wettest, moist, most biologically diverse valley. It's also the most northernmost, a sanctuary, a climate refuge against the dragon breath of global warming. A recreational through hikers club, the Pacific Northwest Trail Association, 
envisioned a straight line conjoining the high volume and immensely popular Pacific Crest Trail to the high volume Continental Divide Trail. Designed as a spur to accept overflow from those other two trails, the proposed Pacific Northwest Trail, PNT, was rejected by the Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service for 32 years. The agency cited first and foremost the deleterious impacts on the endangered yak grizzlies. This is wonky. This is just policy. Anyway, you ask. I have to read it. <laughs> Nevertheless, in 2009, the Hikers Club, based out of Washington State, convinced their delegation to introduce a single paragraph to a must pass federal omnibus bill codifying the trail straight through Montana public lands previously designated as core territory dedicated to the recovery of those few yak grizzlies. I can't help but edit. Designated is awfully close to dedicated. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Currently, I'm, I'm editing as we go. This is, I'm gonna skip, skip ahead. A map can be deadly. A map can be powerful. A map can destroy a million years of crafted beauty. It's easy to forget, lost in the mystery of maps, that not all maps lead to wonder, awe, art, or discovery. It's just more policy stuff here. I'm gonna to skip to the last paragraph. I don't write much fiction these days. There is a cruel red line laid down just beneath the Canadian border and my days and nights now are spent trying to erase it, to bend it south, to birth a new, better map, to preserve the habitat of beauty and of a thing I love fiercely. It is all the same, a life, only the scenery changes, all will be buried or washed away, and yet. Mm -hmm. God, you know, this has happened to me before with your work where I have this credo that I feel like I live by with my work, but you and I have never actually talked about our affinity for that William Carlos Williams line, no ideas, but in things. But it just felt like it was pulsing through those little, like the cruel red line and the map. And then all the ideas that you hook on to the map and to the idea of what the trail is and but it all comes from the, the thisness, right? From the thing. Um, and I think that that's why we're here together on this talk. Like we somehow have this affinity that has, you know, it, it just really speaks to me. That's why your work speaks to me. Um, and and um, I think it's a teaching, like it's the most elemental teaching thing that we must do, right? Is when we when we sort of talk about this idea of, of the, of it's so much more than just the thing. It's it's, I don't know, I like that word thisness. I've been using that a lot lately. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good word for the times because there's not much thisness left anymore. It's like, uh, one, one more interesting observation, two more in, in your novel, the pieces, the chapters become shorter uh, near the end of the, the book. Uh, Again, not not formulaically so, but um, like a a quickening and and structurally, and and it's in sync with the quickening uh, drama of the external and the internal. Um, what was that like? Was that was that super? Were you super conscious? Was it? Did it just create itself? The, re the reason I'm asking, did it create itself, is because. You know, when you get lost in specificity, the way you're describing, then the sentences start kind of making their own path and writing their own way and bringing their own meaning. But so I'm wondering if that was, uh, I guess, as they say, organic or 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 human caused, as if human caused isn't organic. So that's really cool. I hadn't noticed. I didn't know. And I I I love that. I mean, I I'm very drawn to sh the short chapter. I mean, I'm just very drawn to it because I love giving a lot of white space around the, the words and letting them, letting it resonate. Um, but here's the, the thing I'm thinking is that when I did the final chapters, we were in full lockdown. I mean, I had, the book was getting close to going into production, but you know, when you get to do all the, the really important final work and I was in those chapters and those chapters are the most intense chapters. They're 
there that's when the teenage boy has to confront his wanting to be numb and all kinds of of truths are being told and i think probably rick that i was getting in and out as fast as i could sometimes because it felt a little hot to me and i was very drawn to it but i thought oh jesus i hope I hope I can pull this off, right? Like, so you're sort of tiptoeing around and then, um, uh, and you know, I haven't actually ever, I haven't mentioned this, but I have a number of therapist friends and, and wonderful beloved people in my orbit, right? And I, they have no idea how vulnerable I felt about those chapters. So when they started coming forward and casually mentioning how like, hey, I'm gonna try that technique you use in that chapter. And you know, like, I'm gonna try that thing you talk about, about a, a, a weight, a scale for guilt. And I was like, okay, all right. You know, or you quietly know you've passed some secret litmus test. I was like, sure, sure, you do that. So um, it's a long answer to why short chapters, but also I didn't, I thought maybe they had to be shorter because they were so heavy. I think that's it. Well, I mean, it's just totally the phenomenon of, you know, the Venturi effect. I mean, you've got the, the current is concentrating and going right just through the one space it can go through and, and it hot is a good way to describe it. And that communicates well to the reader as well. And it just, um, another cool thing you did stylistically, maybe consciously, maybe not, is the conversations and descriptions between the adults were often certainly between husband and wife were in my observation which could be mistaken were, were shorter and more direct and you gave the boys big loopy <clears throat> complex positions and, and and with just a different kind of sentence was attended to the boys more attention more complexity more I would call it respect uh than, than among the adults, which is a subconscious thing that I think speaks to what you're, you're you know, what you're wanting to promote. God, that's, that's it. That's the word respect. You got, that's the word we haven't said, but that was the, that was the, um, that was the hope. That was the intent was respect, really respect for the teenage boy. Yeah. It, it radiates. That was sweet. So. Thank you. Any, nope. Anybody who has teenage boys or is thinking about it or, or ever had them uh, should read this book. And anybody who ever has teenage girls or any kind of girls thinking about it should read it. So I guess that about covers. Yep, pretty, pretty much, much everybody. Teenagers are a fascinating breed. Um, I'm sitting in our young adult section to my left here. So I'm, oh yes. Um, <laughs> um, but we do have some great questions from our audience that I wanted to make sure we could get to. Um, first off, Joe says, Rick, when you say manners would solve 75% of the problem with respect to grizzlies, what do you mean in particular? How do bad manners come into play with this issue other than by directly killing grizzlies? Well, it is the worst breach of manners to kill a grizzly. Uh, I think, you know, we're talking about respect. When, when you go into the forest, when you go for a hike, when you go into the woods, into the grizzlies habitat, their home, going there is recognizing that you're a visitor, an uninvited guest, a traveler from another territory, that's manners. That's how we used to travel. And you see hikers now with gun bras, you know, double holstered, uh, you know, I mean, know the caliber, they're just big and, 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 and they go in, you know, armed for bear. They're looking to, you know, you carry a gun to a fight, you're going to use it and it, it's ineffective. Um, bear spray would be uh, a better, uh, more effective uh, way to travel through their territory and protect you and the bears. And uh, it'd be more respectful because you would have their, their well being in mind by saying I'm not going to take a firearm to which is <clears throat> whether it was more effective or not is irrelevant it's just not good manners um uh, uh and then further once you start thinking that way you're going to start thinking okay where do they drink where do they get their water what's happening with climate change and, and surface water availability uh what's it like to be wearing a 70 pound fur coat in the summer okay thermal overstory summer summer thermal overstory, where do they get shade? Uh, 
oh, look, this big old clear cut out in the middle of what's called grizzly habitat. That's not, no longer usable to them, is it? Because it's hotter than a skillet. Uh, once you start thinking just with the slightest bit of manner of respect, which is often about just hesitate, just don't be quite so quick. Um, manners can come back into us. Uh, you know, treat people the way you'd want to be treated. Uh, treat bears the way you'd want to be treated if you were a bear. Um, when a bear stands up, when a grizzly, you surprise a grizzly, you know, you, you make, a, you have a <clears throat> lapse in judgment, a mistake, uh, and you put the bear in a bad spot where you surprise it by a creek where it couldn't hear you or the wind's wrong and you weren't re noticing that the wind is wrong. The bear is going to stand up and when it stands up, you are home free. The, a bear does not stand up in aggression. A bear stands up because it wants, number one, it wants to get a better read, different perspective on the situation. It also wants to show off its size and strength and those you're home free. Once a bear is thinking that way, it's not thinking, what can I kill? Where is it? It's, it's, it's giving you an out. But so many numbnuts coming into Montana for the first time, they've got their GD arsenal strapped to them and they reach to an ankle or they reach to their bra or whatever. And they, they see this big standing up target and they shoot it. And it's like shooting a priest or something. It's like, they're just looking up, giving you a chance to, they're giving you a second chance. Or like when you're in trouble is when it's coming at you. The fir your first glimpse of it is it's coming hard. And that's when you need the 30 foot umbrella of spray, not, not your prowess as a six shooter pistolero. Yeah, manners will solve a lot. Thanks for the question. Um, Susan, I think this one might be directed more towards you. Um, how do you balance being a faculty member and supporting emerging writers with committing to your own writing and art making? Mm, that yeah. was my question to you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, they all, it's all an organic, wonderful thing, right? It's a melange, it's a stew, it's a, um, I, I long stopped thinking that you couldn't teach and write and write. I mean, it's, Rick and I teach in a low residency program. Um, I think, I think I just have learned an enormous amount from my students and the dialogue is super, uh, super um, enervating, right? That word. So yeah, they, and I, I get, I have like flavors of the month or of the year where I'm obsessed with a certain sort of craft element that then bleeds into everything I'm talking about and everything I'm working on personally. And I, I love that I get to share that. It's all kind of the same thing, but I change the flavor and um, yeah. We've had some incredible writers come through Stone Coast. So, you know, and now they're my friends and I, I love learning from them. Yeah. Yeah, incredible students and incredible faculty. It's such a, it's such a, I mean, that flavor of the month, that's exactly it. I mean, like I'm a one trick pony specificity. That's, that's all you need to know. That's all I need to know. But <laughs> all these other faculty there, they're, they're like, my God, multiple POV backstory, you know, whatever all those <laughs> other techniques are there. They, there's a little god or goddess of every one of these techniques you could have and then and the student body is is more non-traditional you, you certainly have some powerful young writers and there's not much more exciting than a powerful young writer than perhaps a powerful old writer who's never really written before and it's all it's it is stimulating it is innervating for sure i don't know what innervating is i'm just using it like pretending I know, but it's good it sounds good what does it mean I think it sound, means what it sounds like. We're just going with that. I worry, okay, I worry, I always am afraid that it means be numbing, but I think it means the opposite. Yeah. No, I think it means almost ever that I'm thinking sparkly oh, a lot. Oh, wow. Well, I'll use it more often. Yeah. I okay. think we're gonna have to check. I could be making that up. <laughs> could grab the dictionary. Um, Linda is curious um, if you have some recommendations, Susan. It's hard to know how to support fisheries when as a consumer, I'm also worried about overfishing. Can you comment? Mm, yes. So it turns out that in a place like the Gulf of Maine, where we've been fishing for 500 years, 500 years and, and no end in sight, actually, there are there has been an incredible rebound of a lot of the, the major stocks like flounder or flounder actually never went away. Haddock, scallops, 
So the fishermen that I interviewed for landslide, and I spent a, a great deal of time with a number of them, um, they call it the most sustainable fishery in the world because it is so heavily monitored. They have the largest, what I would call mesh size to their net. So they are catching really, really small amounts of juveniles, which they're throwing back. Um, so there's actually a lot of hope in the Gulf of Maine if we can sort of turn this corner because what happened was we lost infrastructure. We lost, and once we've lost that, we can't really support the boats the way we used to. And that's the problem. And then, and then suddenly you have a, a fishing village that's turned into a tourist town. And that's, you know, um, as one of the fishermen I interviewed said, like he doesn't want to see another tourist town where locals are scarcer than hen's teeth. Um, so that's why, I, you know, that's why I'm willing to talk about this as much as I can. And we're actually, we're going to do some really cool stuff with the book this spring and summer. We're going to do events with um, fishermen and leaders in the fishing community. And we're going to, you know, try to bridge that, that, that sort of where art and kind of art and activism do meet. Um, but as far as fish in, in the Gulf of Maine go, there's lots of good fish to eat. And I can say that with, I say that with, with relief. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Linda also asks, there used to be rite of passage traditions which aimed at marking a child's step into adulthood. There are a few books about this, but do you have any thoughts about that and how it is missing? You know, this is the second time this has come up, this idea that this came up at a reading I did last week that it was from a man said, we don't have traditions, a lot of traditions in the United States for rites of passage for boys. And he felt like that's one of the big things that was missing was these ritualized moments that would make boys feel more connected and more respected and more grounded. And I thought that was interesting. I don't have any kind of answer to it. Um, but I did think that was interesting. I mean, the, the big message for Landslide and for Jill, Jillian, the mother is pay attention. She just, just pay attention, pay attention. She, she almost can't look away when she looks away, someone's smoking pot or, you know, going to apparently drive away to Vermont to do radical things. There's a lot of talk of going and doing radical things. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's about paying attention and, it's not really an answer to Linda's question, but um, I hope that, I hope we, I, I devour books that are done um, well, that honor teenagers, girls and boys. I don't know what that is in me. Maybe it's just, maybe honestly, it's because I'm a mother. It could be. And I have two of the boys species of which we speak. Um, it could be that, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Melanie asks, Susan, can you speak to Nettie's role in the book, what she allows to be named and spoken in the family? And she also comments, can you believe I'm still awake? <laughs> Melanie, hello. Oh, that's very funny. No, I can't. Melanie is a farmer and she should be asleep right now. Um, so Nettie is the school, psych school social worker and um, she... <clears throat> She did, she actually worked some magic, I would say, on um, on Sam, the younger of the two teenage wolves. And the, and when Nettie comes into the picture, that's when that intense stuff that Rick and I were talking about, about like the heavy kind of more intense scenes at the end happen. Um, so her role in the book, she's definitely a catalyst. She's a she's a, she's really important to the book. And, and she's I young. Yeah. 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 She's young. And and Sam cottons to her because I think because of that unspoken, I think, yeah. Yep. That's it, you're right. She's, she knows how to speak teenager. Yep, yep. And I, I do, I, I'm now remembering um, all that structural stuff that you try to forget after you painstakingly write it, but I, I knit her in early. She appears on like page eight. You gotta build her up as a real person, right? And then she, she, because Sam has suffered great trauma already and, and she's already been a part of his life. So she, he trusts her. And that's another huge word we haven't really used tonight, but trust, right? Who, who did the boys trust? 
can, um, you know, I was watching this incredible documentary last night that featured teenage boys. My, one, my younger son and I were watching it. I was very teary. And at one point, the, a lot of the boys were in a lot of trouble. And one just said, he finally got someone to believe in him, this mentor kind of figure. And he, and he said on camera, he was like, all I ever needed was one person to believe in me. And it, it's still, it's, it's been with me all day, you know? And I think, I think Sam feels like his mother believes in him. And I think he trusts Nettie. I think she, she it's in her, her professional way, she believes in him and, and maybe that's all it takes, you know? That's, that's one of the more powerful moments in a, in a book filled with powerful moments is when Jillian goes to catch up Sam, who's <clears throat> up at some bad place, drunk with, with a, just in a bad spot. And she brings, she's doing this internal monologue about do I do I unload on him or do I just get him out of here and like okay don't just don't blow it just don't yeah don't and she's fighting her fury her rage because she she you know you talk about her paying attention like it's exhausting to pay attention all the time and she has to pay attention all the time she never not once in the novel does she not pay attention except in backstory like she goes for a swim to an island or something but it's just like this little drip of of honey and an otherwise you know rolling shit show but anyway she gets Sam back and and I don't. This is not I'm not giving away the end because this is way before the end. But um, uh, yeah, she gets him back there, and he's still drunk. He's not even hung over yet. He's still drunk, and and uh, and she gets him in his bed, and she says, you know, she says, I see you. She says that thing, you know, I, I I see you, and she just keeps repeating it to him. And you know, in his moment of trauma, it's it's powerful. Yeah, one person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rick. I forget. I you know you forget you forget the books you write. I. I'm like, oh yeah, I like that scene. I forgot that scene. <laughs> That's a good one. That scene matters to me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Well, Melanie also has a question for you, Rick. Uh, looking back at your earlier work, what excites you from the past and what do you look forward to in your next writing? Melanie, shouldn't you be asleep by now? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, you, don't you have a lamb to kill or, a, or an essay to write? Melanie is also a spectacular writer. I mean, like, I think she's maybe not even of this earth, I think, but she looks like she is, but she is human, but her prose is not. Um, so you'll true. Be hearing from that young woman, and I don't mean in a postcard, we will be. Um, <clears throat> what was the question? <laughs> oh, I just lost it. Um, looking back at your earlier work, what excites you from the past and what do you look forward to in your next spread? Wow. So there's this horrible phenomenon when you're a writer and you write a lot of books, not every one of them is going to be like the other ones. And, uh, I wrote a book when I was really young called the watch that has, uh, a lot of imperfections, but it had a lot of energy at a time when there was a lot of uh, caution and care going on, the, the short story form was getting super uh, self-aware and, and re repetitive and duplicative and, and formulaic and, and uh, mine were a little different. And, and, uh, and uh, it's, that spoke to a lot of people, not a lot of people spoke to I remember the sales figures, 3,127 of them. But, but the, those who did read it, really, it touched them deeply. And, uh, you know, that energy, that was the energy of a really young writer who didn't know any better. And so when I look back, it's like, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind having another sniff of that, but it's hard to, it's hard to, you can't create it. You can just possess it. And uh, I don't possess it now. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by craft and my sentences are longer and they're just a little prettier. They're not as raw. So I, I admire the rawness of the past. What was the rest of the question? What do you look forward to in your next writing? Yeah, I, I look forward to, uh, I'm working on a, a novel I've been working on for 20 plus years about time and our relationship to time and, and landscape and history and space and I'm just wild about it and it's it's going to be another 20 years but I, I look forward to this novel that I've been engaged with and failing at for for decades wow okay that's intense I didn't that's really cool Rick that you're doing that on this on the side 
Hmm. Whitney asks, how do you decide what to write about and give your attention to? Ooh. Um, all right. Uh, I'll, I'm going to, I'll start and then I'll hand this. Um, it doesn't, it chooses, I, this is just, I almost said it. I, I, I won't, it's too cliche, but it really does choose you. It, you are, I am open. I am waiting. I am waiting. It's, and then the idea comes and then um, it has to hold, it has to hold it sort of, it has to hold itself. I, and I think like I've recently landed on something in the last maybe six months that I think will be the next thing. And so now I'm like walking around it like a, like a, like a used car, maybe like checking it out from all angles to see if it will hold. And um, for me now, because it's interesting what Rick just said, this is very interesting in my, as I move into my mid fifties, I actually want, more, more, um, I'm going to use that word kinetic again. Like I, I'm going to have to be really interested in actually some what's happening because, you know, I, I, um, I, maybe it's because I want that rawness again, that Rick's talking about. Like I, my first book was a memoir that was like, I would, I just can't believe I wrote it. Like it's very unselfconscious. And I just think, Oh wait, stop, you know, um, and so that energy, I think if I can throw, if I can find a, a plot that, you know, I want to write about women and sex and power. Okay. So there's, there's three big things that a lot of people probably want to write about, but they're really helpful for me as, as um, framing devices. And then they're just huge. Right. And then I go in and I try to find the place where I can really, really unpack women, sex, power. And I, th I think I'm finding my way, but so that, that's sort of a little bit maybe helpful of how I choose subject matter. Um, Rick, time, is time, did time choose you in this bigger novel? I think it's a great answer. I mean, I, I love how you laughed. It, it just sounds so teacherly to say, one do, it's, like, it's like a new age yoga guru. Oh, one does not choose one subject. One subject chooses one. Oh, how true, how deep. Uh, I mean, it would be like on a Saturday Night Live skit. Totally, totally. But it, uh, I mean, you're lucky when that happens for sure. Uh, and you save a lot of time when you get chosen instead of you having to do the choosing. Um, I, I, uh, I, I can't answer the question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed uh, to not be able to answer. I've, I've written... 30 some odd books. And it's like, I have a friend who has four daughters and, and she went through a grocery store line with these four incredibly beautiful daughters. They're all about, you know, two years apart from each other. It's, it's actually, I hope she doesn't think I'm speaking out of school. I don't think she will. Incredible essayist, Deborah Gortney. And she's got, the, you know, talk about a great mother, great parent. And, and, um, so she's in a grocery store. I don't know if it was in U it wasn't in Utah for damn sure. I don't know where she was, Oregon maybe. And and uh, and they're these vibrant, you know, gold-headed children, girl children, you know, domino down, 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 down. And and Deborah's, you know, looking through her purse and trying to find, you know, billfold or whatever, and and people are stacking up and their bananas are spilling out of the bag and you know, jars of fruit juice are rolling around and 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 the clerk says, are, are all these children yours? And she looks back and says, yes, they are. She goes, well, I think you should stop. <laughs> I was like, fuck. So I guess as far as choosing and choosing books, maybe I should stop choosing books and wait for one to choose me. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Um, I'm going to springboard off of, of that question um, from Whitney, because I would be curious for you, Susan, um, did the setting or the character come to you first? Um, I had a second question. I'm going to think about while you answer that one. Um, that, that, that's a great, and um, that's, a, that's a, a, a very easy question for me in that um, I knew Maine, knew Maine. It was going to be Midcoast Maine where I grew up, fourth generation um, of my family here. But I was driving up the coast and I, uh, a Fleetwood Mac song came on. And we have a thing here in Maine 
we we Mainers that you can't go a day without listening to a Fleetwood Mac song on the on the classic rock radio station. You really can't. And so the song came on and I was singing at the top of my lungs. And then I thought, well, what if my own wolves were in the car, how much they would hate it. And then I pulled over and I, I wrote the first scene um, and the, they were not my boys. And that was so exciting. They were other boys. And I, um, so, so place, yeah, place started it. And then character came in right away. Really it's voice. It's voice for me. I had to have the voice. I, once I got the voice, particularly of Sam, the younger boy that's in a lot of trouble, then I felt I had like I had something. Yeah. Um, the second part of my question was, do you feel like you would have been struck by or equipped to address this new idea that's percolating about women's sex and power in your earlier writing? Or do you, does it feel like something that has come to you with maturing definitely i had to age and cook <laughs> definitely yeah no i lacked the confidence i lacked the confidence i lacked the scope yeah i mean who the heck knows what i'll be doing with this lofty idea i've just said but i just i don't i didn't have i didn't have any purchase you know now here i am i'm sort of getting getting, getting ancient. So I have some purchase, I think. Yeah. So it makes it, you know, they, they told me that in grad school, I remember being in grad school. I don't know if others remember these moments where they said, you can't really write about that yet. You, you're not, you don't have anything to say yet about that, but you, I tried anyway. And it was like, um, sort of, it was, it was this endless cycle of not really saying what I meant because I didn't know really. And, and now I, I, I still don't know, but I, I have um, years behind me maybe to, yeah. So thank you. And I, I'm just, looks like we're running out of time. I don't want to make people- We are. Yeah, Melanie needs to go to bed. Yes, okay. definitely Melanie. Um, the last question I think I have um, for you, Rick, do you have a status update on the rhinos? I don't, um, I don't, okay. yeah. Sorry to, Fair enough. to say that um, <laughs> I read about them on, you know, Apple Web News, National Geographic every now and then, uh, but I don't, they're like all great megafauna across the globe, they're threatened uh, and worse. Yes. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. It was a wonderful conversation. Um, if you haven't yet purchased your copy of Landslide or Fortunate Son, uh, do be sure to visit the link in the chat and uh, just click on the logo of your favorite sponsoring store to purchase your copy. Um, and we'll be happy to send those out to you. Um, thank you so much, Susan and Rick, for joining us this evening. Um, if you are interested in more Books in Common events, we do have one coming up this Thursday with David Laskin. Um, so stay tuned for more. And um, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Rick. Talk thank to you, you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> fun. Write another book soon, Susan. We'll do it again soon. It's fun. It'll be really fun. Okay, enjoy that, enjoy that dinner. Um, ah, yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs>